Here, the first layer of the universal flowable restorative X-flow of opaque A3 shade is used to mask the brownish reactional dentine at the bottom of the cavity. This first application is properly inserted thanks to the thin cannula at the cervical level and is light cured. A second layer of X-Flow will then mask all the distinctively coloured dentine. It's known that these flowable composites with lower elasticity modulus than the microhybrid composites improve the seal and the marginal integrity of restorations. Here is the M5 shade of Ceramics Mono Nano Ceramic Restorative. With a single compule, we will be able to proceed to the whole restoration reconstruction. Moreover, we will obtain quite an acceptable aesthetical integration into the oral surrounding. Initially, Ceramex Mono is placed in the distal proximal zone, with a small extension already at the level of the distolingual cusp, which is missing. A second layer will allow reconstruction of the lingual wall, beginning with its distal portion. It also helps create the first outlines of the occlusal surface. We then continue adding material to the wall at the distolingual cusp. Note that care is taken at this stage not to place any restorative material at the distal proximal contact point. In fact, sufficient resistance needs to be obtained within the composite wall so that a separation system can subsequently be put in place, thus allowing a strong and solid contact point to be established. We place a last layer of Ceramics Mono at the base of the cavity. Here you see how it is inserted using a completely smooth metallic plugger, which does not adhere at all to the composite material. We then position the separation system, which consists of the paladent matrices and a bitene separation ring. The distal position interferes with the ring and we must then place it in the opposite direction. In these conditions we can obtain sufficient wall resistance to create a good separation. We therefore fill the whole proximal zone, contact point zone and distal marginal crest and light cure. This view shows the whole of the distal marginal crest, which is slightly higher than the neighbouring tooth, in order to allow later corrections to be made. We will now start with the restoration of the occlusal anatomy. That is to say, the whole of the occlusal surface and the various cusps and bulbs that make it up. Account should be taken of the orientation of the bulbs at mesio-vestibular cusp level. The Ceramex Mono is especially easy to work with, does not flow and initially takes the form that would be expected of a bulb in terms of convexity. The fissures are at the meeting point of the various masses of composite that make up the bulbs. They are not drawn as such as this gives a much more natural anatomical configuration. This picture already shows the good aesthetic integration of our Ceramex Mono restoration.
we continue to restore the various cusps progressively. Here, see the cusp that has been completely reconstituted. The distolingual cusp should now be complemented by completion of the bulb. It remains to improve the outside contour of the tooth. To do this, the paladent matrix is moved away so that we can clearly see the line between the lingual and proximal faces. Small additional layers are placed in order to achieve this type of finish. It's already evident that the occlusal anatomical configuration is well done and the matrix can be withdrawn. At this stage, we see that the matrix is quite difficult to remove because of the quality of the contact points. It must be withdrawn carefully and slight bleeding occurs because of its subgingival location. After a rinse, finishing can begin. Finishing starts with a red ring diamond burr mounted on a red ring contra-angled handpiece in order to improve adaptation at peripheral level. We always start with outlining the volumes of the occlusal surface and of the various cusps. The height of the distal marginal crest is then adjusted. The convexity of the bulbs, which was deliberately exaggerated, is reduced a bit. This is particularly important when regulating the anatomical bite. This will allow perfect positioning of the contact point adjustments in relation to the antagonistic tooth. We proceed little by little in small steps. Judicious use of the spray helps distinguish the composite from the natural tooth tissues so that we preserve the tissues of the natural tooth. A few excess amounts still need to be removed, especially at proximal level, and the curettes used in periodontal treatment can also be used to remove these amounts. We now have a clear, almost definitive outline of the occlusive anatomical configuration. A few finishing touches need to be applied and the bite made regular. This bite is positioned at the bulbs, which have been deliberately exaggerated. At this stage, a very precise adjustment of the contact points to the antagonistic tooth can be obtained. Polishing of the restoration surface at this stage is done with an enhanced point. Shining is carried out using again the enhanced system with the enhanced cup and the Prisma Gloss polishing pastes. Two grit sizes, regular and extra fine, are available in order to obtain a perfect surface luster. Intensive rinsing removes all the remaining polishing paste and we see now the good anatomical integration of our restoration. The difference in shade between the tooth and the restoration that you can see at this stage is merely due to the dehydration of the dental tissue. The quality of the contact point is controlled using a silk floss. We see that an excellent contact point could be obtained together with good regulation of the bite, in this case, see the classic tripod obtained. The post-operative x-ray plate reveals the good adaptation of the restoration at cervical level and the good radio opacity of the restorative material. A few weeks later, the good aesthetic and functional integration of this ceramics mono restoration which it must be remembered was applied with a single shade, can be assessed. It yields to complete satisfactory results.